Welcome in to Daily Faceoff Live, your go-to source for everything hockey, live every weekday at noon Eastern. It's Wednesday, February 8th, and this is Daily Faceoff Live. I'm Tyler Uremchuk, and he is our NHL insider, Frank Saravalli. We are streaming to you live on the Daily Faceoff YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook pages. Frank, how are you doing? I'm good. It's uh, 23 days to go until the NHL trade deadline. Who's counting except for me? Yeah, I can tell you one thing. You did not wake up feeling as good as Dylan Cousins did. Knowing he's got about ooh, $49 million coming over the next seven years must be a good feeling. So let's start there. We'll throw two minutes and 30 seconds up on the clock and talk a little bit about the Sabres extending one of their young stars in Dylan Cousins, a first round pick who has really kind of burst onto the scene this year. His first couple years in the league, as you could see here on your screen, you know, it was a bit of a slow start to his career, but this season, I mean, he seems to have just flipped some sort of switch, nearly a point per game player for the Sabres. And what I like about this production as well is you look at the Sabres kind of scoring leaders and it's the big line, right? Skinner, Tuck, Thompson, Rasmus Dahlin in there as well. But Cousins has been doing it in kind of that second line support role. He hasn't had, you know, kind of the line mates that a guy like Tage Thompson has, which makes this production all the more impressive. What do you make of this extension between the Sabres and Cousins? Yeah, this was a major piece of business, Tyler, for the Buffalo Sabres to get done. Clearly, Dylan Cousins, a huge part of their future. And you mentioned Tage Thompson, and I thought that was the perfect blueprint for this contract for Cousins. If you're able to set a team salary cap structure and have everyone fit within that number, that's the way to go. I think you take, if you're negotiating and you say, hey, Jeff Skinner, that contract was signed under a previous regime. We're not dealing with that contract. Tage Thompson signed for this seven years, 50 million bucks. So his cap hit is 7.1 and a bunch of numbers. He gets an extra 300,000 more than Dylan Cousins did. And the reason for that is just look at their production. Tage Thompson is a six foot six center and he's someone that is, has a lethal shot and goals are always at a premium. So when you take a look at Cousins, who's such a, a big part of what they're doing there and will be for the foreseeable future, you go back to Cousins and you say, hey, Tage Thompson signed for X. We're going to sign you for Y just south of that. You'll still be a well taken care of guy in this organization. And moving forward now, the most exciting part about all of that for the Sabres and their fans is they finally seem to have been getting this 10 year long rebuild, right? Is you've purchased the best years of Dylan Cousins career. You've purchased the best years of Tage Thompson's career. So you are well set up for now and the future because both of those guys are already playing at a seven and change million dollar level it's only going to look that much better as the salary cap continues to increase for the Buffalo Sabres who are believing and challenging for a playoff spot. Yeah, they're already pushing to enter their playoff window, you could call it. And I just look at these two deals and think, you know, three years from now when the Sabres are probably or could be firmly in a Stanley Cup window, maybe the salary cap three, four years from now is creeping close to $100 million, And you're only spending 14% of your cap on your top two centers who both could be point a game or better scorers. I just think this was a tremendous piece of work by GM Kevin Adams. Matthew Fairburn from The Athletic in Buffalo is going to be joining us in about 10 minutes time here to talk a little bit more about what the Sabres could be doing ahead of the deadline. Let's take this contract, though, and maybe take a look at what it could mean for a couple of other pending RFAs and two other young players coming out of their entry-level contracts who need new deals, and that's Trevor Zegras and Cole Caulfield. You can see the side-by-side-by-side -by -side -by -side comparison here, and Dylan Cousins actually, throughout the course of his early career, has been the least productive of the trio. But, I mean, maybe he's a bit more well-rounded than the other two. When you look at the way these three guys have kind of gone early in their career, career Frank, and the $7 million price tag Dylan Cousins got, do you think one of Caulfield or Zegers could blow this out of the water, or are they right in the same ballpark? No, I think they're a bit north of this, and the numbers kind of spell that out clearly. And you might look at the total points, and you say, well, Cole Caulfield, too. I, I just talked about the idea of goals being at an absolute premium, and mm -hmm. it's the tear that Cole Caulfield has been on since Marty St. Louis took over as head coach. It's incredibly impressive, and, and you see he's already well north of those guys in way fewer games, uh, almost yeah. uh, 50 fewer games than Dylan Cousins has played, and, and almost 30 fewer 
than Trevor Zegers has played. So uh, that goal number stands out for goal Caulfield. And then with Trevor Zegers, just one of the true talented playmakers that's of his generation, 117 points. He's sort of well north of both Cousins and Caulfield in that department. You see the points per game over 82, uh, 82 game pace, 64 points almost he's averaged. Uh, Cousins has done a lot of growing of late. But yeah. I think if you're Cole Caulfield and you're Trevor Zegers, you're sitting there now on two teams that really for the Montreal Canadiens and Anaheim Ducks, Montreal is going to drastically reshape their salary cap picture, I would think, as soon as this deadline, that those two sides have been talking and they've certainly been cordial. Um, I think that gets done once they have the space after this deadline to go make it happen. And same thing in Anaheim. You know, you want to try and buy as many of the best years as possible. And even if that contract right now in the short term may look a little bit painful in years one or two, in years, you know, three through seven or three through eight, you're going to be laughing, I think, with these players and their quality. And it's something to consider as well. We just talked about this salary cap going up. A contract to a guy like Dylan Cousins could look better and better for the team as the cap goes up players eventually get paid a little bit more. I think back to the Oilers signing McDavid and Dreisaitl saying, hey, we're just giving you the full term and we'll let these contracts age. And the Leafs with Matthews and Marner, took they had to go short-term route. The players in a way kind of wanted to bet on themselves. Do you see either Zegris or Caulfield maybe wanting to go that route where they say, hey, yeah, sure, eight years would be great, but I want to bet on myself and see what the salary cap's like in five seasons. I, I could potentially, but... When someone's handing you that kind of coin, like Dylan Cousins got 50 million bucks, 49.7, it's kind of hard to say no to that. So, um, you know, seven years is not all that different than five. If you want to go way shorter and kind of go three or four, that's maybe where you get into it as a team and you say, this doesn't really make a ton of sense for us to try and uh, be forced into a bridge deal. We're going to try and maybe up that AAV a little bit to make it pay off in the long term. Fair enough. Another big move that was made over the last week was obviously Bo Horvat, which we've discussed a lot on this show, but Horvat making his home debut for the New York Islanders last night. And of course he found the back of the net just at a tremendous pace this season as the Islanders shut out the Seattle Kraken for nothing. Not only did Horvat score, but he also got a pretty nice ovation from the New York crowd. We'll take a look at the goal here, which was set up by Matt Barzell. And what an interesting duo that could end up being for the Islanders. We've heard so much over the past few years about getting skilled to play with Matt Barzell. And it seems like Lou Lamorello and the Islanders have finally found that but let's take a listen in to how the crowd reacted to Bo Horvat scoring his first goal as a New York Islander well a standing ovation for Bo Horvat his first game as an Islander what's the chant here guys do I need to work well a standing crowd chanting Horvat, Horvat, Frank, a pretty neat scene in Long Island as they welcome their new star forward. Yeah, I love to see something like that. Just being welcomed with open arms. You kind of, uh, you know, the hairs on the back of your neck stand up when you hear that crowd chant. You can kind of channel the yes, yes, yes that they chant after the goals as well. And it's, uh, it's pretty electric. And you know what's really interesting, aside from the fit you mentioned, um, to, it, it wasn't just getting skill to play with, Matthew Barzell, it was also getting a finisher. And that's what Bo mm -hmm. Horvat has been this season in a big way. You see the numbers there. His 32nd goal of the season, uh, you know, quickly knocking on the door of 40. It's been magical from that perspective. And so to plug that player in, if you can develop any sort of chemistry, won't just help you at even strength, but also on that power play as well, which has really struggled for the Islanders this season. And I think even more important than the goals, the reason they went out and pulled the trigger to trade for Bo Horvat was for the wins. And they're now 2-0 and since Bo Horvat joined the team on the back half of the NHL's All-Star break. And that is a, is a huge indicator of potentially what's to come. If he can give this team a shot in the arm and they can get in, that's what their bet was on, was that Ilya Sorokin would be able to shut the door. Uh, you know, you see the shutout of the Kraken, you say, hey, We've got the goalie to allow us to go on a deep playoff run here. Let's try and load up as much as we can. So you see, um, you know, Lou Lamorello essentially triple down on this roster after he doubled down in the summer. It's rare to see that, especially for a team that's been so middling, but the results 
are what matter way more than the goals. And if he scores, obviously it's going to help the results as well. Yeah, the Islanders right there in the Eastern Conference playoff picture. They're tied with the Penguins in points, but they've played four more games than Pittsburgh. They are one point back of the Capitals. Islanders have one more game played than the Caps as well. It's going to be a really fun playoff race in the Eastern Conference. And again, we've hit on this so many times, but compare that to last year when there was nothing the stretch drive in the NHL this year is going to be a lot of fun. And that means there's a lot more emphasis being put on the trade deadline. So let's chat a little bit about our deadline countdown series, a new article every day up at dailyfaceoff.com from Frank Saravalli. And today the topic is John Klingberg. And here's where I want to kind of go with this, Frank. When he signed that one-year deal in Anaheim, everyone was like, okay, maybe this is a bridge to like a long-term deal if it goes well. But it was giving a lot of people you know, shades of Taylor Hall and the Buffalo Sabres when he signed that one-year deal. And it was like, okay, they're signing this guy to flip him at the deadline, clearly. And remember, that didn't go very well for Taylor Hall and the Sabres. He scored two goals in 37 games. They eventually moved him and Curtis Lazar to Boston for a second-round pick and Anders Bjork, which is a lot less than people thought they were going to kind of get when the season began. Is this a similar situation kind of playing out with Klingberg where his value just hasn't gone up maybe the way he and the Ducks have hoped? No, in fact, his value has gone down in a significant way. I bet you if you were to inject some truth serum into Ducks GM Pat Verbeek, he would have essentially looked at the contract that they're giving Klingberg and said, hey, for $7 million, we're going to probably have to pay five of it before he's traded. This was our way of buying a first-round pick. And in this case, I just don't think that's going to work out. Klingberg's stock has plummeted. And it's not just because of the lack of point production. I think it's also been because there's been so little help around him on an Anaheim Ducks defense core that really kind of has three and a half bona fide NHL defensemen that his game has been exposed also defensively with some of the mistakes that he's made. I talked to uh, an NHL assistant general manager this morning who was saying, essentially, we view this guy as someone who is now a power play specialist that needs to be deployed in a sheltered way in his own end defensively. And so if you take a look at some of the teams that could be potential fits, I've identified three of them in the Seattle Kraken, the Calgary Flames, and yes, the team we just talked about, the New York Islanders. And the reason for that is I believe all three of these teams have the defensive players on their roster that you could partner Klingberg with where whatever impact negatively he might make in the defensive end, he can be sort of covered up for and sheltered a bit. Obviously, having some solid goaltending would help. You wouldn't be getting that necessarily in Calgary or Seattle. But for the Islanders, a team that just loaded up, depending on what the acquisition cost is, there's not a ton of cap space to go around, but depending on what the acquisition cost is, you could potentially see Klingberg making some sense, again, for a power play that struggled this year. You could see... Seattle and that working and and Calgary just has the actual true defenders to pair him with um, that could also give your team a shot in the arm. So those are the three teams that I kind of see standing out. Calgary, of course, needs to eventually replace Oliver Shillington, depending on how that goes. And we're hoping for some news potentially on that this week. But those are the three teams that I see standing out for a guy in John Klingberg that just has really struggled this year in Anaheim. You mentioned, you know, the Ducks were maybe hoping to get a first round pick. And I know you'll have more in the article up at dailyfaceoff.com later today. But any idea on like some comparables from recent deadlines here? Yeah, I think he's probably in uh, the second round pick range. But here's where it gets complicated is the acquiring team is in a spot because of that $7 million cap hit that not only do the Ducks need to eat half, but also more than likely you need to send this trade through a third-party broker. That's yet another asset out the door. So I could see it being a third and a fifth in order to make something like that happen. I could see you know, maybe just a flat second and a later round pick to, to, to make it go. But the point being, he's not in anywhere near the category that a lot of people assume that he would be uh, heading into this season. And the other part of it too is it also kind of makes – the Dallas Stars look pretty smart saying, hey, they drew the line at a certain point and said, we probably would have re-signed you on a four or five-year deal in the four to $5 million range, but at the price tag you were asking for to be in that sevens or eights, they just weren't seeing it and maybe they were ahead of the curve. 
Yeah, it's uh, pretty interesting to think back to the summer. A guy who entered free agency last year is kind of one of the marquee names on the market, and it's it's really taken quite a turn. Certainly an interesting story to keep an eye on there. Let's move along to our big segment today, another edition of The All 32 with Matthew Fairburn from The Athletic. The All 32 brought to you by our friends at Montana's. You can find him on Twitter at Matthew Fairburn. He is with The Athletic in Buffalo. And Matthew, let's start with that Dylan Cousins extension. I mean, he's earned this deal with his play this season. His numbers have skyrocketed compared to his first couple seasons. From your perspective, what's kind of changed in Cousins' game to allow him to take this big step forward? I think he has a lot more confidence shooting the puck. You know, he went to the world championships last year and before he went, he talked to Don Granado about, you know, areas of his game that he wanted to work on and he wanted to become a scorer. He wanted to become more confident shooting the puck and you've seen his shooting percentage go up. He's playing on a line with two rookies on his wing. So, you know, the numbers he's putting up are extremely impressive and he's, you know, got some power play time now and, they really view him as a huge part of their core. That's been clear, you know, going back to, to last season and in the summer, the way they saw him grow and develop, not just as a player, but as a leader. This is probably a guy that will wear a letter for them at some point in the near future. So, you know, not only is he becoming, you know, the type of point producer that they were hoping for, but he's becoming a core piece of their leadership group as well. Matthew, uh, you know, it's interesting to watch this team sort of grow all year long, now sitting in ninth place in the Eastern Conference on points percentage. They're believing that they can be a playoff team and no reason not to. So the question is, how big of a buyer or how active do you think the Sabres are going to be when it comes to the deadline? Because I think back to their overall mantra this summer of we're not acquiring any players that are going to get in the way of our young guys. Do you see them being, uh, you know, a, a huge player when it comes to the March 3rd trade deadline? You know, I, I think they'll still stick to that that mantra of, you know, letting the young core develop, but they've put themselves in a really interesting spot. You know, the way these players have put themselves right on the edge of playoff contention now means that that Kevin Adams has to seriously think about what he can do to help these guys. Because I think when you're building a young core, and you're trying to develop into a, a perennial playoff contender, getting these players playoff experience would be super valuable also. So I think the big thing with the Sabres to think about around the deadline is that Kevin Adams is not going to do anything, you know, that will jeopardize what they're trying to build long-term. So I wouldn't expect them to necessarily be looking for a rental. If that means giving up a top prospect or a first round pick, they want to keep, pieces of the core, you know, of, you know, that can help them build for the future, like those picks and those prospects. Now, would they part with those if it meant acquiring a player who has, you know, maybe, you know, term on his contract and is a bit of a younger player that could be part of their, their future? I think they would consider that Kevin Adams has called around and, and checked in on a lot of different players in that, that, you know, sort of age group. But this isn't a team that's looking for a rental to just get them over the edge this season. They want pieces that are going to be here and be part of what they're trying to build in Buffalo. And that's another thing that Kevin Adams has talked about is wanting players who want to be in Buffalo. That's a hard thing to gauge on the trade market, how a player is going to feel about coming to a team that is still building and, you know, still trying to shake off the reputation they've developed, you know, over the last decade plus missing the playoffs. So they're an interesting team at the deadline because Kevin Adams is reaching a little bit of a, a pivot point in this rebuild where these guys might be a little bit ahead of schedule from where they thought they would be. And that means, you know, maybe going out and looking for, you know, a, a veteran that can add some depth for a mid round pick and just trying to bolster this roster a little bit. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it's also a good problem to have if you're Kevin Adams. So when you look at a team that scores pretty much like nobody's business third in the NHL in goals for per game, and then you look at some of the defensive metrics and also goaltending, if you had to pick an area to improve, would you would you consider in net uh, or would you try and target some defense help? I'd be looking at defense first and foremost because – Right now, they have a bit of a log jam at goalie. They have three goalies. They, they feel really good about Uko Pekalukkanen and the way he's developing, and they feel so good about him 
that they didn't send him back to Rochester when Eric Comrie got healthy. Craig Anderson is still part of the picture. And so they've made moves on their roster to avoid, you know, putting Eric Comrie on waivers. So I feel like they like what they have in net at the moment. And they feel really good about Uko Pekalukkanen, as they should. He's he's turned a bit of a corner in his development. But it would be great if they could find a, a defenseman who could play on the second or third pairing, maybe a more physical guy that that has some veteran leadership. They don't have a ton of playoff experience in their locker room just because they're so young. There, there's not that many players on the team that have been in the postseason. So finding somebody that has a little bit of that that element and, and can maybe add some physicality because they're not the most physical team on the blue line and they're still inexperienced back there. But I think they're okay in net. And as you mentioned, at forward, you'd have to do some reconfiguring if you added a significant piece to that forward group and you almost don't want to mess with a good thing that they have going. So depth on defense is probably priority number one for them at the deadline. Fantastic stuff, Matthew. Appreciate your time. The All 32 is brought to you by Montana's. You can head to montanas.ca, check out their fantastic lineup of daily deals. Today, Wednesday, all you can eat ribs. There you go. Your dinner plans are already made. Thanks to our friends at Montana's. We also have a $50 gift card up for grabs this week on our social channels. So hit up Daily Face Off on Twitter or Instagram to find out how you can win. Thanks for doing this, Matthew. Thanks so much for having me. Moving along to our daily face-off inbox question. Hashtag AskDFO is how you can send those in. A historic night in sports last night as LeBron James took over the all-time NBA scoring lead, Frank. And that brings up a hockey-related question. Because, I mean, that LeBron, that scoring record at one time was thought to be unbreakable. It stood for more than three decades. In your opinion, Frank, what is the most unbreakable record in the NHL? Well, the scoring record in the NHL for points is never going to be broken. So... You could start there, but I think the next most unbreakable record is 50 and 39. I don't think we're ever going to see that again. So uh, I don't know. Wayne Gretzky holds six. He, he When he ended his career, he held 62 NHL records, I believe. And I think he still is holding 60 or 61. Um, not too many records with the name Gretzky on them are going anywhere anytime soon. See, and I have a problem calling those unbreakable because you just never know how the sport's going to look in 15, 20 years, how scoring could change. You, you could get a generational talent. The one, Frank, that will never, ever be broken is Glenn Hall's consecutive games played between oh, the pipes. That's a good I one. mean, he is in first place by 200 and some games. He played 502 straight games between the pipes, didn't back up a single one. Would you find a goalie nowadays who's even going to hit 20, never mind 500? Uh, no, I, I mean, you, you're not even going to hit someone that's going to hit 70, for instance, like it's, it's just, yeah, yeah, you're this, you're right. This is definitely never getting broken. Yeah. hundred percent. There you go. Point for your rem check on that one. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling confident, Frank, because yesterday I won a perfect two with my points bet daily bet. So we're looking to build up a bit of momentum here. I'm in the plus money in the two days since the all-star break. I'm feeling good. So let's roll it into tonight's slate, courtesy of our friends at Points Bet Canada. Rangers, Canucks, that is the game I am eyeing up, and I love the Rangers on the puck line tonight. The Canucks have been really struggling as of late. In their last 10 games, 3-6-1, and one, that's not very good. The Rangers are coming off a big emotional OT win against the Calgary Flames, and I think they'll be fired up again tonight. Plus, Igor Shesterkin expected to make the start for the Rangers after Halak got the last start for them. So I really like the Rangers on the puck line. They have three straight wins on home ice as well, covering the puck line in two of them. Rangers minus one and a half. And I'll throw a little player prop out there for this game as well. Artemi Panarin has two multi-assist games in his last five. He's got five assists total in his last five. I like taking Panarin to pick up an apple. I, I think the Rangers are going to be able to score a lot tonight and betting on a guy like the Breadman to get in the assist column again after he had two against Calgary. Seems like a good spot to me. So Panarin assist, Rangers puck line. Those are my two bets tonight, Frank. And we wrap with a little garbage time. What do you got? Yeah, I just thought the reaction on social media was garbage after I posted the other day uh, during that Monday night clash at Madison Square Garden between the Calgary Flames and New York Rangers. And I wondered aloud saying, why is Nazem Kadri not being examined for the NHL's concussion protocol after that monster hit from Jacob Truba? And the usual replies that I got 
standard, don't care. Uh, water off a duck's back of, you're a snowflake, why are you so soft, can't take hitting out of the game. I love the hit. I love the physicality. It was clean as a whistle. No issue at all with Jacob Truba. But we talked about on the show yesterday with Mike McKenna, and he was saying, hey, I actually went back and checked to see, hey, Kadri wears his chin strap pretty tight. Like, it's not one of those guys that's flying around with a bucket that's way too big, and he wears his chin strap loose, and therefore, when it flew off, everyone's just kind of shrugged. And my point is, we are 20 plus years into the concussion conversation. You can like the physicality and think the hit is clean and also still be concerned for um, Nazem Kadri and the player's brain. Those two things are not mutually exclusive. So my only point was, let's continue to have the further conversation and let's also educate some people on what exactly, how, how a concussion uh, happens because it's not just a hit to the head. That was the big common refrain that I was getting for people was, uh, it was a hit to the chest. Are you stupid? And it's like, guys, we're well down the track on science and research on this. We know that it's about rotational forces, whiplash, impact, all those different types of things. That was textbook in terms of then examining the player. Don't know for sure whether or not Kadri was examined in between periods in the quiet room. He should have been nonetheless because that was a monster hit. And the way that his body moved from one way to the other was incredible. The force knocked his helmet clear off of his head. Think about what was going on inside his head yeah. at that exact moment that that happened. Glad to hear that Kadri's okay. Glad to hear that he said uh, that he had no issue with the hit because I don't think anyone does and no one's trying to take physicality out of the game. The only point is we should at least just further the conversation and help educate people. Yeah, well, I mean, while I do love people calling you soft in a snowflake, Frank, because it's hilarious, I also love the point you're making with this because even Kadri himself said he liked the hit, he took it like a man, but these protocols are in place to protect the players a little bit, kind of from themselves in some instances as well. It would have taken five minutes to send him down the tunnel and double check this. I'm glad you said protect them from themselves because players we know now just don't self-report injuries. So if he was feeling the ill effects of it, he's going to sit there and, as you said, take it like a man and continue to play and not say anything. And that's what we're trying to avoid is just go the extra mile to make sure that these guys are okay so much as you can. Very well put, Frank. And uh, we are out of time for today's show. We'll be back tomorrow, though, noon Eastern time. Thanks to everyone who tuned in on the Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube streams for today's show. Keep it locked on Daily Face Off in the meantime, and enjoy your Wednesday night. We'll chat tomorrow. Thanks for tuning in to Daily Face Off Live. Make sure you hit the subscribe button to never miss an episode.